everyone, my name is Sarah Squires. I am the founder of The Nurturing Coach, author of Help My Child Has Been Used as a Weapon and Communicating with a Narcissist, and the creator of the Get Caught Ready programmes. There's something going on here in the UK um, with regards to uh, a domestic abuse bill. And one of the questions um, or the debates that's surrounding it is, is putting parental alienation in the domestic abuse bill, uh, putting more children at risk. And I wanted to explore it because it fits into my work. I've worked with parental alienation, I have personal experience of parental alienation. And so I wanted to look at the current argument for both sides really so the side that is saying yes it is going to be a risk to children and mothers is what is their argument and that's ultimately the crux of it is their argument is that parental alienation is made up junk science only used by fathers to abuse the mothers and the um, children is a made up phrase by a paedophile. That is pretty much in summary what Barnett, Katz et al are saying when they argue that parental alienation should not be included in the domestic abuse bill. So I want to address each one of these points individually um, and see where we end up. So first off, the gardener thing, you know, this is the common one that gets thrown in is that parental alienation was made up by a paedophile. So Gardner was the first person to put it into a structured form and call it parental alienation syndrome. It's not a syndrome. It's not um, been labelled as a syndrome. It's not in the DSM-5. However, the behaviours that he described... And ultimately, that's what's important here, are. So I first want to address the paedophile thing. You know, he said some things that he probably shouldn't have said. Um, I don't know the specifics of what he said. But what he described as behaviours were accurate. My argument would always be, you know, there's lots of people in history that have made, you know, Shakespeare, one of the UK's, leading literary heroes talked about teen suicide and teen marriage things that are no longer acceptable and I'm not saying they're the same but you know he talked about some things that are no longer acceptable in our society does it mean that his work loses any of its value no of course it doesn't and it's the same for this yes Gardner isn't a great poster boy for parental alienation but we can't keep barking up that tree because it's moved on so much so let's put Gardner to bed whatever he said his actual description of the behaviors was valid it did it wasn't a psychological construct which is where I I don't like the term parental alienation because it, first off it's talks only about the parent and I would want to be child focused but also you know it doesn't have a basis in psychology so I'm not keen on it but ultimately it is recognized in case law and so it is a term that's used and so we you know the that horse has bolted we've got to call it what it is so the next one is junk science which is incredibly insulting to the hundreds of people who have worked so hard to do well, well established, peer reviewed research into the behaviours. Take it down even further than that, you know, you might not like parental alienation or the term of it, but we know that personality disorder parenting is harmful to children. And that's what parental alienation is it is a disordered parenting style. And and so when you say junk science, you're not only dismissing what you think is dismissing parental alienation, you're also, you know, first off, you're being very insulting 
to every single person who has done these research papers and every single participant in that, but also to the DSM-5, to all the tons and tons of evidence there are around personality disorders and their parenting styles and you know how personality disorders develop so junk science is actually incredibly you know it, it's it's quite childish and it's very insulting and absolutely totally irrelevant to this argument because it's not junk science. It is based in fact. It is based in psychological principles. The behaviours are. The term I get, but the behaviours that it describes absolutely exist within psychological constructs. So that brings me to my next point, which is the name. You know, <coughs> as Shakespeare that I've already brought up, what's in a name? Does it matter what we call it? I agree. I don't like the name. However, the behaviours exist. Calling it parental alienation, calling it coercive control, which I'll come on to. Does it matter? What we're talking about is child abuse. So I think we need to let go of the need for the name and the importance of the name. And I admit I've struggled with it myself, but ultimately it's in written in case law. You know, it is used. We, we're stuck with it. So let's get over get over ourselves with that and accept it's called it's called parental alienation and focus on what it is underneath. So let's bring it into. So the next argument on that is that it um, it's actually coercive control. And you know, I've got it here. Emma Katz, Anna Nikki Pateri, and Merger Leitinen wrote when coercive control continues to harm children. It's a considerable document written October uh, 2019. Um, and actually it describes behaviours, post-separation behaviours quite well. The problem being, the second part of their title is post-separation fathering, stalking and domestic violence. And this is where the issue comes up. Coercive control has been hijacked as has domestic abuse in many respects by the feminist crowd who ultimately say it is just about men doing it to women. Um, when actually what this is about, that you know, that you call it coercive control, you're automatically thinking that that's adult to adult. When actually, parental alienation is about the child. The child is the one being abused. And coercive control, we can't use that against the child. So it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit legislatively, which is what the DA bill is looking at, with our current description of coercive control. Yes, you can coercively control the ex, but not the child. And that is what is happening in parental alienation. The child is used as the weapon to control and abuse the um, the ex. So it just doesn't fit with current legislation, current description and the behaviours. So it we can't use that. Also, it misses the mental health element. <laughs> That's kind of like the big chunk of what parental alienation is, is that this is done by a personality disordered parent. Not all parental alienation, you know, the, the sort of lower end. I'm talking about the, the, the ones that end up in protracted law, the ones that this is really going to be used for, is done by narcissistic or borderline personality disordered parent. And we know there's 60 to 70% of child maltreatment cases involve a personality disordered parent. This is the big issue here, and that's constantly being missed is coercive control doesn't cover that doesn't acknowledge that and so it's really important and the argument that it's just men again falls down when you look at the mental health aspect of this because based on figures from 2006 men the prevalence of personality disorders amongst men is 43.3 percent and amongst women is 56.7 percent 
So that would suggest that the majority argument that they're talking about is is wrong because what you know you've got fifty six point seven percent majority of women have personality disorders. Sixty to seventy percent of maltreatment cases involve personality disorders. So therefore, the majority of maltreatment cases, abuse, child abuse cases, involve a woman. You know that's just. So when you when you seek to take that bit out, you are distorting the reality of what is happening. So next off, I want to look at domestic abuse. And the issue with that is we all have schemas in our brain, which are like trees. So you say the word domestic abuse and immediately it branches off into images and other words. And let's face it. Domestic abuse is and is being continued to be argued that it only happens to women by men. So, you know, let's look at that in more detail. First off, not true. But there's so much evidence that men are victims of domestic abuse. They use the term majority a lot. And I've just used it there. 56.7% to 43.3%. Yes, it is a majority, but it's a small majority. And does that mean that because only, you know, the majority of women suffer with personality disorders, does that mean that we therefore assume that all women have personality disorders and therefore abuse? Of course not. But we have to be aware of those statistics. So same with this. Yes, we can be aware of the majority again i'm not 100 on the on the statistics of domestic abuse because i think that there's lots of factors that prevent men from recording also that doesn't account for same sex relationships um which is a big downside and also and it happens in parental alienation case i've worked on numerous cases where it is same sex couples and so you are dismissing a large proportion with that also you know, only work, create a piece of legislation that only works for the majority of the population. Is that not a throwback to some horrendous crimes in history? Is is this not, you know, what what we fought wars against? That we didn't want to only serve the majority, that we wanted equality we, and we wanted diversity. So creating a bill which only is represented by the majority of victims or is only useful and, pu and purposeful for the majority of victims, that's not a world I want to live in. That's not a society that I want to be part of. And I am absolutely astonished that anyone would be supportive of that. You have to look at the people that have been involved in the consultation process for the domestic abuse bill. They are not representative of a diverse and equal society. You need to look at that. I'm talking to you, you politicians, the members of parliament who are, who are pushing this through and who are going against parental alienation. You know, you are part of the problem you are saying that we only support the majority of victims when actually it's a minute majority. It is a, if it is even a majority, as I'm stating, I don't think statistics are necessarily accurate, but you can argue that about any statistics. So we'll go with what's on offer. But I, you do you really want to be part of a group of people that only, only, um, support or provide legislation for uh, one part of society because that's been fought against for such a long time this country is meant to be about equality and diversity and these people that are fighting it this is what you fought for in the first place you were fighting for equality and I think you've forgotten that you or you've forgotten what it means equality means equal for everyone equal opportunities equal support equal legislation for everyone so if you're going to campaign for that you have to acknowledge that there are more victims than what you represent you need to have you need to have 
more ethnic diversity you know what about i work with a lot of um asian men who are affected by this asian women that are affected by this people from african countries that are affected by this uh people from um east european countries affected by this were they represented in your consultations men women were they represented same-sex couples were they represented you take a long hard look at that because that's really important you know if you're gonna be don't if you're gonna say that you are here to represent all people which is you know that's the vow that you took when you were entering parliament you've got to represent all people um and so yeah that's you can't argue for equality and diversity and not include all victims and men are victims as well might not fit your narrative but it's true and there's so much evidence that shows that um so my so my final sort of main point is in 1989 an american psychologist called charles murray wrote a paper called the underclass which i know mps know about um and it talked about fatherless society and Parental alienation is, although it affects, it, it affects mothers, it affects grandmothers, it affects grandfathers, it affects aunties, it affects uncles, it affects siblings, it affects lots of people. But the domestic abuse bill, which is only supporting female victims, and I'm not saying that there aren't female victims, I'm not saying that women haven't been treated terribly in the past. I, I don't deny that there's been inequality but you don't correct inequality with more inequality you correct it with equality and so you have to acknowledge that that men are victims as well and creating a fatherless society the outcomes aren't good the outcomes you know society has shifted and you know charles murray plots very well the changes in you know depend welfare dependency knife crime gang culture teenage pregnancy plots it against sing the rise in single mothers i've nothing against single mothers i'm just saying that there's a pattern here so if you raise fathers we're not helping our children and what are we creating for our own boys that are born the boy is born and he's labeled you're going to be abusive and you're going to be irrelevant in any children that you have in your in your life you know we've got to think we've got to support and protect everyone and my final big major point on this and my question to those who deny parental alienation exists and refuse to allow it onto the domestic abuse bill is if you doubt so much that this exists or even if you think it it's or, or if your argument is that it's going to cause more harm wouldn't it be better to have it in legislation so that professionals were trained to recognize what it is because, because you agree that the behaviors exist you just argue that only women are on the receiving end of it but if you've got professionals trained and if it's in legislation they will have to know their stuff they will have to understand it thoroughly with no excuses wouldn't you want that if you're so sure that you're right wouldn't you want qualified and trained professionals involved all the way through so putting it in legislation gives you that protection it makes no sense to me that you wouldn't want that if you don't think that if you think it's only used by abusive fathers then let it in and let people train to understand what the signs are and then the behaviors will become apparent and that's what's so important and ultimately it's about protecting the children and we only protect children when we protect all victims we acknowledge all victims and we give them the best chance of having a equal and diverse opportunity for their own lives moving forward and so i absolutely agree that parental alienation should be included in the domestic abuse bill i think it will have the opposite effect i think that it will protect more parents 
and children and I refuse to get on the may on the gender bandwagon and if that's all you're interested in I feel sorry for you but please those of you that are in decision making positions please consider the facts please consider what I have said what I've talked about here look at the raft of research that other wonderful people have put together to support why it's so important that this is put in and also going forward consider domestic abuse doesn't just affect white women or women it affects men same sex same sex relationships it affects like say eastern europeans africans asians it affects all nationalities please involve more people in your um discussions around how we can work with domestic abuse because we're not going to make change if we don't acknowledge and involve all parties that are affected by this i will um pop the links to my um research below for you to look at yourself draw your own conclusions but take care everyone bye bye